Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Adrian Lindholm, and I coordinate the Wilderness Stewardship Program for the National Park Service in Alaska. And you have joined the Wilderness and Traditional Indigenous Beliefs webinar. Um, this webinar is being recorded, just so you know. As part of my job, I get to facilitate an interdisciplinary team from virtually all of the Alaska National Parks um, that advises leaders in the Park Service about wilderness stewardship. And each year I host a series of webinars or special calls as a way for our team to learn more about a particular topic of interest. Sometimes if we think the topic might be of interest more broadly, we'll open it up to other agency folks to attend. And this is one of those occasions. So I am delighted to be here today with you and welcome our guests, Polly, Bernadette, and Roger. Um, Roger Kay from the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge sent me the article that's attached to the webinar invite. And the article is called Wilderness and Traditional Indigenous Beliefs, Conflicting or Intersecting Perspectives on the Human Nature Relationship. And I knew that it would be of interest to our Alaska NPS wilderness team. So I was thrilled when the three authors agreed to speak with us. To me, um, the value of the article is showing how three people from three different cultures and perspectives value and connect with one particular place. And that place is part of the homeland of the Gwich'in and Kupik people, and today is also known as a wilderness area um, within the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And since we have folks on the call from outside of our Park Service Wilderness team, I'm going to provide a couple pieces of information just to make sure that we're all coming from the same starting point. Um, the first is that since the word wilderness can mean different things to different people, I want to be clear that we're talking about the federal wilderness designation, which is like an overlay on top of our national parks, national forests, wildlife refuges, and outside of Alaska over BLM lands as well. It's a designation only the U.S. Congress can grant, and it provides the greatest level of resource protection of any federal designation. And the role of National Park Service wilderness stewards like our team here um, is to interpret and implement the 1964 Wilderness Act. And the act supports our interpretation of wilderness as a place that honors indigenous people's stewardship, history, and connections where people are integral and belong, that are homelands and places with long and complicated human histories. And finally, one more item to the stage is our team has been more directly and intentionally prioritizing inclusion and relevancy for the last four years or so. And we've focused conversations and webinars, trainings on a variety of aspects of inclusion in wilderness. So this webinar today may not cover the breadth of topics related to indigenous perspectives on wilderness or inclusion in general. Um, I just want to set a reasonable expectation for those um, joining outside of our, our group. Um, for example, we have looked at how these lands that we now call parks and refuges are lands that were taken from indigenous people and how all of the tools of colonialism, including conservation designations, have caused great harm to indigenous people. There are many facets to the conversation. So please keep in mind that this particular webinar is one webinar in a larger multi-year program of work and learning for our team. Um, I hope that contextual information adequately sets the stage for the exciting conversation we're going to have today. Um, Polly, Bernadette, and Roger, your article is beautiful, and it really left me with a feeling of hope. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to turn things over to the three of you. Um, we have, um, you know, all three three authors, three panelists here, and they'll each have an opportunity to speak, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. 
So for all of our participants today, feel free to write questions in the chat at any time. Um, I will attempt to curate the questions and I'll ask the panelists to field them after each of them has had a chance to speak. So um, without further ado, let me introduce to you Roger Kay. Roger has worked for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in Alaska for 41 years as a planner, pilot, native liaison, and in recent years as the agency's Alaska Wilderness Coordinator. He has a PhD from the University of Alaska where he has taught courses on wilderness, environmental psychology, and the Anthropocene. He's the author of Last Great Wilderness, the campaign to establish the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, and numerous journal and popular articles related to wilderness. Currently, he is working on a book considering the future of the wildness of wilderness in the Anthropocene. Roger, the floor is yours. Well, gee, thanks, Adrian, and thanks for tuning in, everyone. Uh, this is really a fascinating topic. It's it's rooted in the past, but you know it's it's also about the future, and it can be controversial. And there are misunderstandings of plenty in this subject, and they're mostly due to a misunderstanding of what the Wilderness Act wilderness is and what it is not. But first, uh, I'd like to introduce the two co-authors of this article and invite them to make just a couple introductory remarks, and then each of us will speak for a while. And then when we're done, as Adrian said, we'll open it up to your questions, comments, and maybe challenges. So with that, uh, Bernadette, if I could introduce you. Oops. Well, Bernadette Dementev is Gwich'in from Fort Yukon and Venati. She's the executive director of the Gwich'in Steering Committee. And gee, she's served just a lot of leadership roles in Alaska, serving on the boards of, just to name a few, the Native Movement, the Care of Creations Task Force, Defend the Sacred, and the Arctic Refuge Defense Council. And especially related to that, I'd just like to say that Bernadette is, uh, is just possessed with the soul of an advocate. No one I know has provided more spirited, persistent, and effective defense of the Arctic Refuge or more actively pursued environmental environmental justice than Bernadette. So Bernadette, would you like to say just a couple things? Uh, hello to the group. Um sure Jingunzi, Shorji, Bernadette Dementif Oji, Kuchaja Kutsan Eastly, Shahan Badi Fit Oji, Shiti Bernard Horns P Oji. Um I am the executive director for the Gwich'in Steering Committee. Uh, I started off as a part-time admin assistant and worked my way up. Um, I always believed in what um, Jonathan Solomon told me. If you have it in your heart, you have it. And um, just to always speak from your heart and to remember that this is not about you. This is about your people, your land, your animals, and your way of life. And I always try to keep that at the top of my mind. I'm very honored to be sitting um, alongside you guys and um, sharing what's really happening in Alaska and how we are being treated by um, our own elected leadership. Merci, Cho. Okay, well, thank you. And next, Polly. Let's see here. I can get this next slide to advance. Okay, Polly Andrews is Chupik from the villages of Chivak and Lower Kalskag and from Fairbanks. She recently graduated from UAA with a master's degree in culturally responsive education, and she's planning a PhD program in indigenous studies. Well, for the last nine years, Polly has worked as a training specialist for the South Central Native Foundation's family wellness program where she focuses on native culture and strengths as a meaning a means of addressing intergenerational trauma. Well, this year uh, she received the Rasmussen Foundation Artist Award for her programs expressing Alaska Native oral traditions through story, song, and dance. So, Polly. Hi, Waka Queen of Polly Andrews, Chuchtun Atra Na Piruk. Apama Atra Ulran Billy Andrews Auchlu, Mauchlu Matlu Cecilia Andrews Awuk, Koyana Dunklum G. 
So my name is Polly Andrews and my Chupik name is Napiriuk and my family originates from Kisunak. Today we call it the village of, of Chivak. And um, my grandparents are the late Ulran Andrews and um, today Cecilia Andrews, she's 90 years old. And my parents are Genevieve Andrews of Chivak and Roger Kay of St. Paul, Minnesota. And I am Chupik, and today I live and work on Denina lands, which I'm grateful um, for the stewardship of, of the Denina people. And also I wanna thank Adrian um, uh, with the National Park Service and Roger Kay with Fish and Wildlife Service for the invitation to come and share our perspectives and experiences today. There is great value in welcoming the voice and the inclusion of the first peoples of this place. Also, I want to thank and acknowledge Bernadette for, for being here and offering her story and her, her um, strength as a Gwich in person. I had the great fortune of knowing many strong Gwich in people since my childhood and which in people are truly the model of, of strength, endurance, um, connection, and nobody else knows the interior better than a which in person. So I'm so thankful to, to see you here as well. And I wanna, um, my dad was talking about, or Roger was talking about the, the family wellness warriors and what I do with the program. And I wanna share a little bit of the why behind uh, what I do. So the goal of family wellness is returning to the strengths and the values of Alaska Native and American Indian culture to build healing relationships, community connection, and resiliency to trauma. And our name Nuiju is a Denina Athabascan word that was gifted to us, and it means returning to our true selves. And it carries the idea that our true self lies within the good teachings of our grandparents and the good ways of our ancestors. And it's the idea that that resiliency and healing happen when we return to the strengths and the good ways of our people. And in that lies Nuiju, that we return to our true selves. And I do the work that I do because we have a, a future generation ahead of us. Today, I'm a mother to three small children ages 11, nine, and seven. And it's so important to have our vision towards um, towards our future generations. So it's good to be, be here and, and thank you. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you, Polly. And uh, I'll begin my section here with how I came to this subject, which is through two interests, really. Uh, the first is an academic interest in the historic and philosophical underpinnings of the wilderness idea and how that later became enshrined in a federal law. And secondly, it's through my 1970s pre-Anilka and early post-Anilka work with the Fish and Wildlife Services Refuge Planning Division, for which I spent a lot of time, I was privileged to spend a lot of time in villages, uh, on trap lines and at fish camps, talking to people about their life ways and how that might relate to the proposed new regulations and new refuges. <clears throat> well, Simon and Bella Francis of Chalkitsik, shown here, were chief among my mentors and guides to understanding not just the practical things like how refuge status might affect their subsistence activities, but, but more interesting to me and deeper was how the agency culture being laid upon their homeland related to the beliefs that they grew up with. Beliefs related to, for example, humans role in the larger world, the interrelatedness of humans and the larger community of life, and the need for humility, respect, and restraint in relating to nature. And hopefully more on these from the two experts that know much more about these than I do. <clears throat> But anyway, the, the generalized traditional indigenous worldview, this, this set of assumptions and values and guides relating to nature has a great deal in common with the underpinnings of the Wilderness Act. And I argue it's the commonalities, not the differences that we should first recognize. But more on those indigenous worldviews from the other two, but let's look first at 
these two words, big and little w wilderness, and the misunderstandings that develop from their conflation. And I appreciate Adrian uh, beginning uh, recognizing this problem. Well, capital W wilderness, as we know, refers to specific areas designated by Congress with purposes, provisions, and prohibitions that are spelled out in the 64 Wilderness Act and in succeeding wilderness acts like ANILCA, and they're described in our legislative history in the agency wilderness policies and regulations and so on. This is the wilderness that we as agency people are concerned with. And this is often conflated with this little w wilderness, which is a general, uh, often effusive, romanticized, and often unrealistic description of landscapes. So this is the pristine wilderness, the virgin wilderness, the I ask God made it wilderness. Uh, it is what uh, Wilderness Act Howard Zahnheiser jokingly said, this is where the hand of man has never set foot. Well, the point is, this is not Wilderness Act wilderness, or and it's certainly not the idea that our agencies should perpetuate. And the conflation uh, of these two words has led to a really, I think, misunfortunate unfortunate misperception that wilderness status somehow erases indigenous history from the landscape. Well, it doesn't, but the notion that it does remains, and it's hurtful to those whose homeland has become wilderness. So consider that when wilderness movement leader Bob Marshall first defined wilderness, he specifically recognized that, for example, as he said, trails and temporary shelters, which were common before the white race, are entirely permissible. And that is why that the Wilderness Act on page one describes areas qualified as wilderness as generally appears to have been affected primarily by the forces of nature with the imprint of man's work substantially unnoticeable. And you'll note that many of the early iconic artistic representations of wilderness included indigenous people, including this uh, for the Park Service folks, this is probably the most famous uh, Thomas Moran uh, piece of art uh, in the history of uh, national parks. So the second point I'd like to make is that this idea of wilderness that we have today is not an inherent component of Western culture. In fact, it's relatively recent. The wilderness concept arose largely in response to changes wrought by the Industrial Revolution. And the wilderness movement as we know it today uh, accelerated uh, during or right after World War II in response to massive industrialization, urbanization, you know, the rapid loss of natural areas, destructive logging, mining, agricultural practices, spread of pollution and pesticides, and so on. Well, these were not a part of the world that pre-contact people lived in, but they're now part of the world that we all share. So the point is that before widespread environmental alteration and degradation, there was no need for the concept of areas left free from them, but there is now. So I just say, let's remember that wilderness was a reaction against the modern new order of environmental threat. It certainly was not at variance with indigenous people or their sustainable lifeways, which in fact, really wilderness literature often extolled and romanticized uh, as it often does today. And I just say that I think that to say the idea of wilderness is alien to, for example, native culture is a bit like saying that the idea of national parks is alien to Western culture, since the idea was absent for 95% of its history. And we should recognize that it's the national park status or wildlife refuge status uh, with its agency culture, its ideology, its regulations that has far more effect on indigenous people than does just the wilderness overlay. So with that, I'd like to move from the past to the uncertain, but certainly different, unprecedented Anthropocene future that we all face. It's a future wherein an ever increasing proportion of our land will be altered, managed, domesticated, and probably ecosystem and geoengineered. So the critical issue of our time of all future time for all of us is human earth relations. And the precepts that traditional indigenous beliefs and the underpinning of the Wilderness Act share 
Well, they remind us that there can be other, more sustainable ways of relating to the world. And so I'm going to share just a few slides that I use in my Anthropocene classes to encourage people to question their dominant Western worldview, assumptions and beliefs, and consider the ideas that both underpin the Wilderness Act and traditional indigenous systems of thought and belief. And one is this belief uh, that many of us grew up with in the human separateness from and right to dominate nature. And that contrasts with the general native worldview that humans uh, are a part of nature. It's more of a sense of connection and belonging and relatedness. The belief that accumulation of stuff and wealth are what brings happiness and well-being. And that contrasts with a native worldview that's based much more on sharing than on competition, more of a sense of community, of reciprocity, of being non-materialistic. And a confidence that consumption and growth and progress can continue as they have, compared with the native perception that it's not a comp capitalist competition, it's not materialism, there's more of a sense of restraint. And finally, and I think very importantly, our assumption, this Western assumption that science and technology can solve any problems incidental to progress with the native view that it is a much more humble view and more skepticism regarding scientists and uh, the Western society's overconfidence. Well, the Dr. Reverend Trimble Gilbert, who is portrayed here, is a Gwich'in spiritual leader who reviewed these comparisons. And he agrees that this statement by Howard Zahnheiser, the Wilderness Act's author, speaks to the commonalities that he sees. Slide reads, to know the wilderness is to know a profound humility, to recognize one's littleness, to sense dependence and interdependence, indebtedness and responsibility by Howard Zahnheiser, author of the Wilderness Act. And, you know, if you spent much time with rural people, and I don't mean interviewing them, but you'll come to realize that for the most part, this is much more aligned with their worldview than is our dominant Western paradigm. So finally, uh, what the question is, what might our agencies do? Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service do to address the ill feelings that have arisen from erroneous perceptions of pristine wilderness without indigenous history, without indigenous presence or a human nature ethic. I'll give just one example that some of us in Fish and Wildlife Service are working to revise our wilderness policy to explicitly recognize these points. Slide reads, Proposed addition to the Fish and Wildlife Service Wilderness Policy. Thus, from the outset, the policy recognizes that before the refuge system and wilderness ideologies were overlain upon their homelands, indigenous peoples had holistic and harmonious worldviews that prescribed the appropriate relationship between humans and the earth. The interpretive themes section of this policy describes components of these traditional worldviews, many of which are especially relevant today as we enter the Anthropocene era. Okay, so that I'll just say, conclude here that, you know, I think our agencies could and can work with our tribal partners to craft policy statements and interpretive and educational outreach and inreach messaging to convey these rather overlooked perspectives. So with that, I'll turn it over to Bernadette. Um, once again, thank you for having me. Uh, so I think one of the things is communication. Um, I think there's a lot of lack of, um, a lack of education and involvement. Um, you know, there's, there, there's people that believe that, you know, whatever a bill says and, you know, the um, senators or whoever is pulling it through, tell them that this is not a good thing. So they believe it. They don't do their own research. I encourage everybody, do your own research. Don't listen to other people. Don't listen to, I mean, uh, congressional leaders. I mean, some of them are very good people, but do your own research. Um, I have learned a lot since I started working and 
One is um, not everybody is a support of us. Not everybody is in support of indigenous involvement. And um, but the fact that the um, case is that climate change don't care what color we are. It doesn't care if it, we're rich or we're poor. It doesn't care if we're black, red or brown. We are all going to be negatively impacted and we do need to come together and uh, we need to stick our differences aside, come together and start preparing our children for the future that they are going to be, you know, living in. Um, I have five children and six grandchildren and I worry tremendously for their future, especially with all the, um, with all of the classes that I've been taking, um, it's it's very concerning. Um, for a long time, we had people coming into our homelands, making decisions about our future, not involving us, and destroying what is sacred to us. And the Gwich'in, um, you know, this is not just about the Gwich'in. The Arctic Refuge is not just about the Gwich'in. We may lead the fight, but it's not just about us. It's not about just the Anupiak. This is about the uh, indigenous people in Alaska. And what we, I mean, we still have 90% of our food is still our land. And just recently we had record breaking fires, thousands and thousands of dead fish in our rivers and our lakes. We had dead birds literally falling from the sky, erosion, and 33 coastal communities eroding. And I just went out hunting. I didn't even recognize the Yukon. There's erosion and there's trees just falling in. And it's concerning. It's very concerning to me. Um, I don't only use my voice for myself, my people, but I use it for my future generations. I like money. I mean, I'm not going to lie. Who doesn't like money? But not if it's going to negatively impact our future generations. Not if it's going to negatively impact our people. And there is much, much more to Alaska than oil. We have some of the most amazing people that ever walked the planet that's here. We are master survivalists, and we will never give up fighting for our human rights and to protect our sacred lands in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. We will stand up to anyone who seeks to destroy it. Um, I want to share that during the EIS with the Bureau of Land Management. So, the Gwich'in Steering Committee represents 14 communities throughout Alaska and Canada. The only communities that they went to was Vinitai, Arctic, Village, and Fort Yukon. They completely disregarded our Canadian relatives who will, whose lives will also be negatively impacted. They left out Beaver, Circle, Chalkitsik, they left out many, many communities. And during this time, they wouldn't let us even speak. Um, it's just, it's frustrating that we have to be fighting for our human rights this way in 2021. Uh, I, I do believe that um, in my heart that the indigenous people are rising up like never before, not just in the, not just in this country, but in all across the world. We are rising up because we know what is at stake. We don't have another earth to go to. This is it. We have to take care of what we have left. Um, you know, the, um, the leadership in 1988, they only gave us um, three directions. And that was to go out and tell the world we are here to do this work in a good way 
and not to compromise our position. Now, do this work in a good way. That's a simple sentence, but it's not always easy when you're up against dishonesty and misleading statements from our own elected leadership. But we continue this work in a good way anyway. And um, I just, I want this misunderstanding that these bills that are going through that are in our best interest are being shot down by our own leadership. And it would be the, it was, it would have been in our best interest. So I'm, I'm just confused on where they stand. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the Arctic refuge is considered federal land and over 90% of Americans want this last untouched ecosystem in the world protected. And I think the, it's time that the government starts respecting that um, the people of this country. We're the ones who's going to have to live through it. We're going to be the ones who have to live through the destruction that these people are going to cause. And so that's why I use my voice. Thank you. Let's see. Okay, thanks, Bernadette. Uh, Polly? Uh, Kuyana, Bernadette, for your, your words and perspective. Um, I want to go back to the way that I introduced myself. And first, I'm going to share a PowerPoint. Roger, I don't know if you need to unshare, but I am going to try sharing. Um, as well. OK, try it here. OK. OK, is this visible to everyone? Yes. Yes. OK. Um, all right. So I will just. Great, so. I wanted to go back to the way that I introduced myself before, and I introduced who I am in a Chupik way. And I did this because my grandfather, my grandmother, who you can see here in this slide, um, she's pictured on the left. Uh, she's dancing on the land in her hand-sewn regalia. And she always told me, when you meet someone, you tell them these three things, and they will know who you are. She said, in Chupik, you tell that person your Chupik name, Dapiriuk. You tell them who your ancestors are, and you tell them the land you come from, Kisunak. She said, if you say those three things, that person will know exactly who you are. And one of those things that stands out to me is she said to introduce yourself by the land that you come from. And it reminds me of this Chupik truth that our identity is not apart from the land, but that the land is a part of our identity. The land is a part of who we are. And so pictured to her right is my grandfather, he was um, a subsistence seal hunter, a walrus hunter, a mass carver, a drum maker, a song composer. Um, he told stories with the drum at Yurak. He told stories through, through, through Chupik dance with the surrounding villages, which is often pass knowledge and information and story through our dance motions and through drum and through song and through story. And um, 
Also pictured here are my drift netting aunties and who I will refer to in story. And they helped raise me also on the Cuscoquim River with their knowledge of the waters and the land. And something else that also brought uniqueness to my upbringing was the reality that I grew up with a foot in both worlds. Um, and pictured here is, is my father. And by that, I mean that I experienced two very different cultures when it came to experiencing the land and the waters and connection with nature. I spent much of my early childhood in the Yukon Cuscoquim Delta region with my grandparents, aunties and uncles living a subsistence way of life and following the seasons, following the change of the seasons. You know, my grandparents who are pictured here, they were raised in the Qazriq era. Qazriq means um, sod house or community house. And the Qazriq era means that they were born and raised in sod houses and they experienced the old ways of living. So their teachings and life ways was a part of my rearing. And the other part of my world was life with my father, you know, being raised in, in Fairbanks and traveling throughout Alaska in his Cessna 170, you know, hiking rugged mountains in the Brooks Range and crossing glacial streams to explore wilderness. You know, this was such a different way of connecting with nature. And, you know, Growing up um, in the YK Delta, much of what I was taught and what was shown to me was through the power of story. You know, stories were exchanged by my grandparents and aunties as we picked berries across the land, as we traveled across the water, as we prepared fish together, as we steamed um, in the maqi, uh, as we sat in the smokehouse smoking fish. Story was a part of of my rearing as well as um, song and dance and drum. So in story, I wanted to share some of my experiences and my perspectives with you as it relates to this topic of, of wilderness and some of the things that I learned. And I wanna um, appreciate some of the slides earlier that Roger shared, um, the slides that depicted dominant worldview and native worldview and the stories that I want to share today really help paint a picture of that native worldview and what it means for me today. Um, when I was a little girl on the Cuscoquim River, about five or six years old, one of my earliest childhood memories was when my late grandfather, Bugok, he would take me drift netting on the Cuscoquim River, just me and him. I would sit in the boat and we would both sit in silence as he would oar um, the Cuscoquim River and as he would slowly lead the net into the water. And then we would begin to drift and we'd watch the net drift with us. And as we drifted, the buoys began to bounce a little bit, which meant that there was life in the net, there was fish in the net. And once the buoys came to life, he would drift for a while and he would put, he would pull the net back in and he would go through the task of removing all the fish from the, the net. And, and he would do something, he would sit in the boat when all the fish was in the net. And instead of racing back up river again to try another drift, he would sit there in the boat for a while and he would let time pass and he would in silence look around him and the boat would drift. And I don't know how long he, he would let the boat drift, but it felt like a long time. And years later, um, you know, I was at my family's fish camp in my adult age and uh, I had gone out in the boat with, with my cousin, Jubuk, my grandfather had passed long ago and we were in the boat together, drift netting. And he did the same thing that my grandfather did. He would drift and he would pull the net in. And instead of rushing up river to throw the net in the water again, he would sit and wait for a while. And we asked him, how come we're, we're waiting? And he would make a motion 
something like this. And we ask him again, how come we, we don't run upriver and put the net back into the water? And he, my cousin finally said, we wait for the fish to pass. And then I understood that long waiting period of my grandfather as he sat in the boat in, in silence and in calm because he was taught by his father and his grandfather that you wait on the river and you wait for fish to pass you by, to go up river, to go to the other communities, to go to spawn. And that's what that moment of calm and of resting um, and mindfulness was about. And um, two summers ago, I was at our family's remote fish camp on the Kuskokwim, the same place I was as a child. And our fish camp is on a quiet slough off the river. And often, you know, it's so peaceful that many days would go by before you hear the sound of an outboard motor. And it's one of those places at fish camp where life is just right. You know, the kids play without fighting. The family is working together. The soup tastes perfect. And there's no need for a calendar, a phone, an agenda, or a ticking clock. And my Auntie Annie, she's the best dry fish maker that I know. She dries and smokes her fish to perfection. And one day as I was watching her kind of light the logs um, in the way that she lit them, I asked her, how do you smoke the fish so perfectly? How do you keep the smoke burning so constantly? And in her own quiet, humble way, she went on to explain to me some of the things that go into smoking fish. She explained the different kinds of smoking um, woods that we use. She explained that the wood is used for different weather. She explained that she looks at the cloud covering and notices how low or high the cloud co covering is. She notices the direction of the wind and how the air feels. And then she lights her wood. And I was so impressed with all the things that she considers while smoking fish. So I asked her, do you come outside and, and look around and think about all those steps before you do them? And in her own humble and quiet way, she paused and she said, no, I just know. And it was then that I knew that this way of life and this act of smoking fish was much more than just a process. It was much more than just a bunch of steps to do it right. This was Auntie's mind mindfulness. This was her solitude and this was her connectedness. And so um, that same Auntie of mine, I remember another thing that she would do when we were little. Whenever we'd put the boat into the water, she would do something interesting and unique. Before a long trip on the river and we put the boat into the water, she'd lean over the edge of the river and she would take river water and she would splash it on her face. And I asked her, Auntie, why every time we put the boat into the water, do you, do you take river water and you splash it on your face? And she simply looked at me and she said these words, so the river will know us. And that's all that she, she said, so the river will know us. And then we would go on our long river trip to pick berries or to gather from the land. And I never understood those words then in my youth, but I feel that her message was one of I'm here, I'm not on the land or dominating this place, but I'm woven in and I'm part of the fabric of this place. And here, and that is the strength of our people and the strength of our native life ways. My grandparents and the people that came before me and the people that came before my grandparents and even Auntie Annie helped show me that we can live with the land in ways that are sustaining. We can live 
in ways that honor and protect protect it and it today you know my roger said something about this is the place that we all share today and it would be unrealistic to go back to the way that life was a thousand years ago because that's not the reality of the world that we live in but we are now all a part of the fabric of this place and so i want to go back to that word nuiju um, that I shared in the beginning uh, when I introduced myself. And it's that idea of returning to our true selves. And that's not just an indigenous value. These are ancient and human values that, that connect us all. We were all once Nuiju. We all come from a, a, an ancient place of walking softly on the land. We all come from an ancient place of walking gently on this place of living in balance with nature and sharing that good stewardship. Those are values that are inherent, that are should be deep within all of our DNA. And that word nuiju, that's a word that belongs to all of us. And it's that idea that healing and strength happens when we go back to those old ways, when we go back to those values and we return to our true selves. And in closure, um, I wanted to share a Yupik drum song with everyone. And um, this, this is a song called Tlavut, which means our world. And I share this song with everyone today because in our Yupik and, and Chupik culture and in many indigenous cultures, our songs and our dances and our drum are a part of how we pass on stories. They're a part of how we pass on um, knowledge and 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 life and how we how we remain connected to one another. And one of the things that connects us is song and it is drum. And so with that, I wanted to share this song with you all. And it's called Slavut. And it was composed by Asi Gayok of Chafornik, Alaska. And the part that really grabs me is the part that says the land will remain the same and the weather constantly changes. And I asked the composer of this song, what did you mean by those words? The land will remain the same and the weather constantly changes. And he said something like, um, we live in a place that even though so much has changed around us, you know, society. He goes, our language is still here. Our values are still here. And though change is constantly around us in many different ways, it's our heart that remains the same. And in a way, the land remains and is, is there with all of us. And with that, I want to unshare and Share the song Shavut with you all. Oh, <laughs> 
I'll pass it back to you, Roger. OK, well, I'll pass it to Adrian. Wow, thank you. I just want to savor all that for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> From both of you, Bernadette and Polly, thank you so much. Such power and spirit. I see in the chat there are some comments of thanks. And um, it looks like there is maybe a question, Polly, for you. How do you correctly spell that phrase, Nuiju? Um, and so, Polly, if you want to type that in or tell us, it'd be fine. And so, um, I see Polly wrote it in the chat. That's great. Thank you. Um, for our participants, this would be a good time to type questions into the chat for any or all of our guests today. And so please go ahead ahead and type in questions or comments. Um, I have a question um, and it. <clears throat> I'd invite any of you three to respond. I feel like it relates to um, what Roger opened with in his presentation. Um, you know, he made this distinction of the little w wilderness versus the big w wilderness and you know i i believe that's true many people associate that little w wilderness as a pristine place void of people and having two wilderness concepts one with people and one without seems problematic um I've heard people say, oh, I can't use the term wilderness because it's offensive, but I support the federal wilderness designation. Um, and so I'm I'm curious what you think about that and what you think we should do about that. Roger, I might invite you to respond to that if you can. Okay. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned, it's really a, a the major uh, barrier, I guess, between uh, for a lot of people accepting the wilderness concept. This misperception. Uh, I think, in part, our agencies have, uh, you know, Park Service and Fish and Wildlife Service, have been a little bit guilty in uh, not clarifying that difference and and specifically not recognizing. Uh, explicitly recognizing uh, the indigenous history and presence, which I think adds a lot to wilderness character. And I argued uh, years ago when our agencies were developing what's called wilderness character, uh, the protocol that that in Alaska, at least uh, this this history, this human presence ought to be part of the character of these landscapes. Perhaps uh, now we'll be more ready to do so. so anyway, what do you? Other two think. I can um, 
add to this, Roger, um, you know, going back to the words of Zahnizer, he had mentioned he was talking about wilderness and, and he had said a piece of the long ago we all have with us. And referring to um, in wilderness, and he talked about the sense to keenly to, to look at our membership in the whole community of life and earth and the humility of knowing ourselves as dependent members of that great community of life. And it's that idea that we're interwoven and we are living beings who are interwoven with the land and and with um, nature and that it it doesn't exist without our indigenous persons and our values and the way that our values are interconnected and interwoven in. And I really appreciate the words that were shared earlier about realizing and noticing the littleness also of ourselves here. Um, you know, the example of my auntie bending over her boat and taking the river water and splashing it on her face in acknowledgement of the river, it almost feels as if she was humbly acknowledging, um, you know, that little humbleness of her presence, but that interconnectedness that, you know, there's a much bigger and we're part of a, a much bigger and broader place and we're only a small piece of that fabric. Yeah, well, uh, I know you met uh, Zana, is there Howard's son, uh, the author of the Wilderness Act, Polly, and uh, I guess we, Ed has talked about, and I, I truly believe that our wilderness policies and our agency approach has been amiss in, in being squeamish about not recognizing that that's the underpinning of the Wilderness Act. It isn't just recreation. It isn't just ecological values. It's this interrelational dimension. And it's it's this very common uh, what he talked about with what you described it with your family. And I, th I think it's where I first learned it from was actually from Gwich'in people and maybe Bernadette can speak to that. But in talking to the, the, the elders that I knew really uh, when you got down to it, that's how they felt is being part of a larger something larger. And, uh, and Bernadette has mentioned, you know, this idea of community of life that is in the Wilderness Act was not a 1950s invention by Howard Zahnizer, but it was really part of, I know, Gwich'in culture for, you know, thousands of years before that. Absolutely. Um, we have always held the Ijikwasan Gwendai Gwotlit, the sacred place where life begins. We have always held it very sacred, so sacred that we don't go there. Even during times of food shortage, and starvation, um, it was off limits. And that's how high of value we hold to it. The porcupine care, our creation story tells us that there is a time that we were able to communicate with each other and we would take care of each other. So for over 40,000 years, we migrated alongside them. So if you look at our our migratory route and our Gwich'in communities, they're nearly identical. So our ancestors settled us on the migratory route so that we can continue to live and thrive off the land and the animals. But because climate change and because of the oil um, industry, you know, many of our communities no longer get it. That don't make us any less Gwich'in, it just makes us that we, that like where I'm from, for Yukon, we have to go all the way to the border to hunt, and that's so much more dangerous. And right now, our environment up here is so unpredictable that people are falling through the ice at times. It is supposed to be solid frozen. We have seasonal hunters that know the land by the back of their hand, falling through the ice and drowning. And um, you know, we just had our very first Arctic Indigenous Climate Summit that was held in Fort Yukon, um, Kuchaja, 
and it was all traditional knowledge. We had two Western scientists there. That was Joel Clement and um, Joel um, Brie Van Dam. And, um, you know, Stephen Frost, he he came all the way to Fort Yukon at the age of 87 or 89 um, to tell us enough with the talking, enough with it. It's time to get active. We don't have time. And unfortunately, he passed away four months later. Um, and we dedicated the, the, you know, together apart, it was called our gathering. How um, the Gwich'in continue to stand united in love, in strength, and in unity to protect our sacred lands in the Arctic Refuge, to protect our people and our way of life. Um, we are interconnected. We are interconnected to everything. This is all we know. We didn't go looking for no fight. We didn't ask for no money. We didn't ask for no oil. We didn't ask for no jobs. We're simply asking to live off the land that Creator blessed us with. But the land don't belong to us. We are caretakers of the land. And sometimes some of us forget that. And so I, you know, I just like to always remind everybody of that. Our, um, we ha our fish, our caribou, they can't tell us when they're sick. They can't tell us when they're starving or what we are doing as humans is hurting them. We have to be their voice for them. And um, that's what I'm just gonna continue to do. Um, I'll never lose hope. I'll never give up because giving up is not an option for us. I'm going to um, read one of the questions that has come up in the chat. As a white American, I have difficulty believing I can have the same connection to this land that Polly and Bernadette have, making my work feel more like an outsider rather than, um, than a part of the land. How do I think correctly about this and integrate this into my work with other non-native co-workers and employees as a park service land steward? Um, so I'd like to answer that. Um, we've actually had some issues with this. I don't look at the color of people's skin. I look at what's in their heart and what they value. And um, we cannot beat up um, people because of what their ancestors did. We have many, many people that are stepping up to try to do what is right. We have many people trying to get involved, but we also have to watch out for tokenizing. We um, we are simply trying to protect who we are as an indigenous people, who we are as um, you know, our identity is not up for negotiation. And we shouldn't have to give up everything that we know so that we could send another country oil. Um, and right now, like Alaska, we are down almost three times the rate as the rest of the world. We should be leading in climate change. We should be standing at the forefront and sharing what we are witnessing, the sinkholes, the big water holes that are in the Yukon River, the erosion, but it's not happening. We're being, we're kind of being forced to fend for ourselves and we're being forced to travel across the country to talk to elected leadership who would actually listen to us. Um, and I just say, you know, if you have it in your heart, same thing Jonathan told me, he said, I went to the third grade 
and I said it to one of the biggest governments in the world. If you have it in your heart, you have it. Um, but, but at the same time, you need to learn from me. We need to learn from each other. Um, it's the only way that we're going to. It's the only way that we're going to get through this. That's so good. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add that, uh, it, and I can't say as eloquently as, as Bernadette does, but uh, I was with Trimble Gilbert uh, camping years, many years ago, and we were talking about wilderness and the comparing the wilderness ethic and his his beliefs. And I asked him, what is this landscape, Arctic Refuge, really? What do you really see in it? And he said, he said, well, Roger, I'll tell you, but you won't understand. You won't feel it, but I'll tell you. And he said, what I see is this land holds the bones of a thousand generations of my ancestors. That's what I see. And I, I realized then that I can never perceive the Arctic Refuge as he does. Uh, I don't have, and most of us white folks don't have a sense of place. We came from somewhere else, but the thing is the Gwachin are there and they're always gonna be there. Uh, and that's, that's a, a connection that's really, really powerful. But we can learn from that and appreciate that. And I, again, I think that's part of the character. It could be the wilderness character of these landscapes that we have people that, that still are relating to this landscape that, and, and you know, and one last thing uh, Trimble would talk about, he says, when, when we hunt caribou, it's more than nutrition. Uh, it's, it's part of who we are. And he, he didn't say the word Adams, but he says, every time we eat a caribou, there are some components of my great, great ancestors that I'm consuming. And it really meant that it was a communion with generations of previous ancestors that they had died and their part of their essence went into the caribou. It was very insightful, extremely ecologically insightful. And again, we, we don't listen and try to understand because again, Trimble often speaks in stories and uh, it doesn't come out and say it as we would, but when you listen, I really listen to people. It's just a tremendous wisdom and the thought that, uh, you know, some atoms of that caribou meat he's eating today were part of his ancestors' bodies. I think that's just magical. Yeah, uh, thank you, Roger, for that powerful um, depiction. Um, and I, Timothy, I'd like to answer, help answer the second part if I can, how do I think correctly about this and how can I integrate this into my work with other Native co-workers? Um, I know that as a society, we're getting a lot better at this, but I would say start with the idea that each of us, no matter where we are, can be aware of ourselves within cultural humility and um, cultural humility is not just about asking yourself, do I have cultural awareness or do I have cultural understanding? Although those are good, it's simply not enough. The question should be, what am I doing to create environments where justice, equity, and inclusion are foundational? That justice, equity, and inclusion aren't decorations in the middle of the table at the conference, but that they are foundational in the work that is being done. What are we doing to foster those connections and those partnerships? Um, Roger speaks of a time of being in the wilderness um, next to a fire with, with Trimble Gilbert, a, a well-known traditional Gwich Inn man. Um, what are we doing to truly get to know the people who are here? the community that is there. And not only that, getting to know the strengths and the values that have guided um, our people for thousands of years. And so it's really going back to that place of, you know, when of, of cultural responsiveness. It means looking to the strengths that are already there, looking to the strengths of the people and the local knowledge that have been the solution that have guided the people and what can we do to grow in that um, and to to really be a part of those solutions and to get to know the local knowledge. 
Thank you, Polly. Um, there's another question that I want to bring up from the chat, and that is um, regarding land acknowledgements. Um, providing a, a native land acknowledgement is becoming more common in the public lands context. Will you share with us your views of the need or appropriateness of native land acknowledgements, particularly in the wilderness context? I believe that it's always important to acknowledge whose land you are on. For instance, the first um, trip that I went on, we started off in Arizona, drove up to Nevada, um, Colorado. We, we went to like four different states. And when we went to Arizona, you know, um, I know that our partners that were setting this up for us had enough time to um, connect with local indigenous people there, but they told us they couldn't. And that first day, I had this so like uneasiness. And there was four which in there was my daughter, myself, Janine, Canadian which in and um, a John Jick, which in Chilkitsik. And, you know, we, um, I just didn't feel right. We went outside and we prayed, just us. We prayed together. We prayed for, um, we thanked Creator for being on their land. And not even 15 minutes later, a group of women walked in and they were all dressed up and they said, um, this is our ancestral homeland that you are on and we welcome you. And, um, you know, we apologize for not getting a hold of them. Um, and they didn't take it to heart. We just shared stories. And so now I always, always take it upon myself to, um, if, if they don't find anybody, I don't go. Um, it's just respectful. It's for me. Um, I mean, might not be for other people, but me, for me personally, I feel that it's important to acknowledge whose land you're on and um, invite them to any events that you're doing. But, um, it's not a good feeling to have people come into your homelands and just doing things and not involving you. It's been happening for hundreds of years, and I, I'm sure the heck I ain't going to do it to other people. It's not a good feeling. Yeah, I would add to that, um, Koyana Bernadette. Uh, to me, I think land acknowledgements, um, how they feel to me is is not just about acknowledging um, the people who have stewarded this place forever, but it's also recognizing our strength, our resiliency, the way that our people resiliency um, resiliently, you know, rose up in the face of very difficult things in in history um, and traumatic things in history, but that that strength is still here, that resiliency is still here, and our voice is is still here um, in this place. And that often um, it's that resiliency and strength and that voice that is so much um, an answer to the problems that we face today. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. Um, I see one more question in the chat, um, and it's it really could. Um, it's not directed at one particular person, so I'll just invite any any of you to respond. Um, are there obvious things to do to reconcile indigenous people's worldviews with Western worldviews as it relates to wilderness?
Well, I would just briefly say, uh, I'd like to hand it over to the experts there, but uh, it's it's focusing on the commonalities. And, and just too often in, in the recent decades in America, we focus on differences. We, we uh, uh, it's a divisive approach. And I think there are a lot of commonalities. Now there are differences, some reconcilable, a few that may not be between the wilderness ethic and traditional beliefs, but there's so much in common. And I think that's what we should look at again. Uh, speaking for my agency and probably the Park Service too, we, we tend to be too squeamish about some aspects of our humanity that Howard Zahnheiser spoke to that were really the underpinnings of the Wilderness Act uh, that we have in common with Indigenous people. And I think that's where we ought to start. Uh, yeah, and I could just add um, to that, you know, going back to that idea, Roger, what you said reminds me um, of those words, you know, we were all once this way, we all come from a place of um, stewardship and connection uh, with the land and these values of gathering around a fire, of gathering together to heal um, are a part of of who we all once were and we share that. And another way I'd like to answer that question um, in a little bit more simple terms. You know, there was a teacher in my village of, of Kalskag and he was a Gusak teacher, a white teacher. And I would notice that at all of the gatherings, um, you know, we gather together for memorials, we gather together for birthdays, we gather together when someone is lost in our village and we eat and um, the whole village comes together in a home. And, and this gossip teacher would always come um, to our gatherings and he would sit on the floor with us and he would eat our foods. And I was watching this one gossip teacher and he was eating our foods and coming to our gatherings and and uh, eating our, our beaver and our moose and everything. And that was so different and that was so rare from what I saw from the other teachers. It made my heart swell with here is a person who, who also cares enough to know my people and to try our food and to sit with us and to know our ways and get to know us. And it was such a, a different um, feeling compared to other teachers who would come and teach and go back to their homes and disappear within a year. And today that teacher after 20 years is still living in our community. He's made our community his home and he's raised his family there and he took the time to know our people, to know our life ways and to also enrich his own life um, with those, with our values. Um, can you repeat the question one more time, please? Um, yes, absolutely. Are there things to do to reconcile indigenous people's worldviews with the Western worldviews as it relates to wilderness? Well, I always, I always believe that there is something that we can learn from each other. For instance, when I first started traveling to Washington, D.C., I didn't know what I was doing. I had no guidance. Um, and uh, it was overwhelming. But I had people down there that were teaching me, you know, the how it is down there. It's so fast paced. It's so busy. It's so concrete. <laughs> um, and and then, you know, then we then they came back here to Fort U, um, went to Fort Yukon with us, and they got to share our culture and our way of life and our, and um, I just think communicating, sharing, um, just as long as they're not trying to take it into and abuse it, because that has happened over and over. So, you know, there's a lot of trust issues within our people. Um, and 
but I, I do believe that we are working with good people these days. We have a lot of support. We have a lot of allies and um, they're not getting into the coastal plain. All right, um, just looking at the time, I um, I feel like I'm gonna start to close us out for this, this webinar session today. And um, it has just been a, an honor and a joy to share this space with you. Um, thank you so much for, I've learned so much. It's been a really amazing hour and a half. Um, Bernadette, Polly, and Roger, is there anything that you would like to say in closing? No pressure, just want to um, give you the opportunity if there's anything else you'd like to share before we sign off. I would like to, um, you know, the assault that happens on our land is an assault on our people. Um, the more man camps that are opened, the more um, women that goes missing, um, and that, you know, there's not enough being done about it. We, we have to look for our own people, and um, I just want to bring awareness to that, and that, um, you know, we're real people, we're mothers, we're fathers, we're grandparents, and we matter too. So I just want to leave everybody with that. Yeah, and I, I guess I would go um, back to that idea of our own self-awareness and our, our, our own mindfulness. Um, you know, I took a class a year or so ago and it was called mindfulness and we were able to practice all these mindfulness techniques um, in class and learn why they were so important. And the more that I learned about mindfulness, the more that I realized it was such a native value that had guided my people, you know, just the simple act of my auntie stepping outside of the smokehouse and feeling the air and knowing the air and knowing the cloud covering without thought but just being in that space of of solitude and that that guided her the way that she smoked fish the way that she approached life that was her mindfulness that was her solitude that was her connection and I feel like that that is such a human thing that we all have in ourselves to walk in that mindfulness, to walk in that um, walk softly on the earth together. And that's something that we can all do together um, is practice that mindfulness, our place on this earth and, and to walk softly together. Roger, any anything else from you? Or are you feeling good? No, those were good words to end with, I think. Gosh, I agree. I agree. Wow. Um, I hope that you are able to look at the chat. There are just streams of words of gratitude and thanks to our panelists. And um, I would echo that. I feel like you've buoyed our, our day and our week. And we're just so grateful for your time. and in spirit and generosity with us today. Um, thank you so much. Um, I have re recorded this. The recording should be available. Um, if you are outside of the agency um, and you're interested in knowing where the recording might end up, um, drop me a note uh, in email or, or chat if you have that ability. And then um, once it's ready, I, I'll know who to, who to notify. Um, so with that, everyone, please take care. Thank you so much and have a good rest of your day.